Good evening and welcome to the second forum. Uh, this is the forum for candidates for State Senate District 13. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Mon County, Morgantown, Mon County, by the Morgantown Kingwood branch of the NAACP, and by the Community Coalition for Social Justice. The only thing we need to call to your attention on this slide is that early uh, deadline for registration was today. So we're hoping everybody who's here is registered. And to note that the Westover VFW is not a polling place this time for uh, early voting. They're having HVAC problems. So. On the screen here is just information about how to, uh, um, how to get an absentee ballot. and important contact information. If you have any questions, it's very easy to get to the Mountain County Clerk, which I'm sure you all are very familiar with, or to the West Virginia Secretary of State. Our candidates for this evening for District 13 are Ms. Barbara evans Fleischauer and Mr. Mike Oliverio. The format for the um, forum tonight will be that each candidate will have two minutes for introductions. Then we will ask a series of questions which we will alternate the person who starts first. And then we'll have a minute and a half or so at the end for closing statements. We'll start our introductions with Ms. Fleischauer. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank all the groups that agreed to sponsor this. Um, it's nice to be here this evening, and I think that what we are partaking in is very important. Um, our government is based on an election process, and Making sure citizens are well informed is, is part of that. So thank the League of Women Voters, the NAACP, and the Community Coalition mm -hmm. for Social Justice. Um, I um, am happy to be here tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. I am um, married. I have two adult children and two grandchildren, and I'm an attorney. And I have been a member of the House of Delegates now for over two decades. I enjoy being in the legislature. I like solving problems and um, coming up with solutions. It's kind of like, like a mystery. Try to figure out how you can, what, you, what words to use to make things better. And I think everybody who's running for office and in the legislature, that's our goal, is to make a better state. Um, and I, I think that my experience is helpful and my legal skills are helpful and um, my work ethic I think is helpful. I, I think I'm one of the hardest workers in the legislature. Um, my slogans are fighting for fairness, getting things done. And um, one of the reasons I ran in the beginning uh, is I think that we don't have enough representation of women in our legislature and other um, underrepresented people. Um, I, one of the things I'm most proud about in terms of getting things done is passing the insulin uh, copay limitation. Uh, this in 2019, three years before Congress did. So I think my time is almost up and I look forward to questions. And Mr. Oliverio. Test. Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Thank you very much. Dateline, September 28, 2022, Oak Hill, West Virginia. The quick thinking of an off-duty nurse saved the lives of two West Virginia police officers on Tuesday night. WBOY first reported on Tuesday night 
that two officers were hit in the face with an unknown substance after a pursuit. Fayette County Sheriff Mike Friendly released the following update about the incident on Wednesday morning. Around 6 p.m. on September 27th, 2022, an officer with the Oak Hill Police Department stopped a car near C. Adam Tony Tires. When the officer was near the car, the driver and passenger ran away toward US Route 19. The officer initially caught one of the suspects. When he did, the suspect reportedly attacked the officer. The other suspect continued to run. A second officer arrived to assist with the first officer. During the struggle between the officers, the suspect reportedly reached into his pocket and ripped open a bag believed to be narcotics and threw it into the faces of both of the officers. Bystanders nearby managed to stop and help the officers in arresting the subject when one of the officers suddenly collapsed and began to actively overdose. Shortly after, the second officer began to show similar symptoms. An off-duty nurse helped administer Narcan, which was what saved the lives of both officers. I suppose most of us believe that would be a crime. My opponent, Delegate Barbara Evans Fleshauer, believes it is not a crime. The West Virginia Legislature voted earlier this year 95 to 2 to make that a law. Delegate Fleshauer voted against that. What if that was your husband? What if that was your son? What if that was your daughter? I was trained to fight as an Army officer, and I will fight in this battle against fentanyl, and I will protect you and your family. Thank you. We'll move on to questions now. These questions have been um, given to us from various organizations and individuals around the county. Uh, we will start by asking Mr. Oliveria. Yeah, I'm wondering if I might be able to respond to that. Not yet. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Sorry. I will call to, uh, to everybody's attention that this is a forum. So we're really only uh, answering questions and we're not having time for rebuttal. Um, we'll ask this first question to start with Mr. Oliverio. In September, the legislature passed HB 302 to restrict abortions in West Virginia. Voters are still interested in your position on abortion. What is your position on HB 302? That, that is a hypothetical question because I was not a member of the legislature when that issue was addressed. Had I been there, I believe with my leadership skills, the bill might have been shaped a little differently. But what I will say with respect to abortion is my position is very different than that of Delegate Fleshauer. While we both served in the legislature together, we dealt with the issue of parental consent. I believe that a parent should know and be able to consent for their young daughter to have an abortion. Delegate Fleshauer believed that parental consent was not necessary. I believed that informed consent was important, that if a girl or a woman were to have an abortion, they should be provided information as to the procedure and the details associated with it and the risks associated with it, and they should be provided information about the developmental stages of the unborn child. I voted for informed consent to provide information to women. Delegate Fleshauer voted against it. I voted to ban the practice of partial birth abortion. Delegate Fleshauer voted for that barbaric procedure, and their vote in the House of Delegates, there were only two people who voted to continue partial birth abortion. I would suggest to you that if the subject of abortion arises again in the West Virginia legislature, I will tell you I am a person who is pro-life with exceptions and I will deal with the issue of abortion with great compassion and great understanding and I will deal with it in a way very different than Delegate Fleshauer has dealt with it in the past. Thank you. Ms. Fleshauer, what is your position on HB 302? I'm sorry. I voted against HB 302. Um, I feel that it was overreach on the part of the government. 
I think that when the, it is in effect an abortion ban, and it is in effect forced pregnancy. And, um, and what I mean by that is the government is saying that women are incapable of making moral decisions, that they do not have the right to do that, and that the government is going to make those decisions about their personal autonomy, about their personal body, and they will not be allowed to make that. I think the exceptions to that bill are meaningless. Um, and, and I think that's especially true when it's applied to my granddaughter, who is intellectually disabled. Um, she would have to report that uh, within 48 hours. Um, she would have to, her parents, she would not even know that she was pregnant and that she was going to have a baby. She doesn't really know other than what baby dolls are, what it means to be pregnant. And I'm very concerned that that situation would be the same um, after she's age 18, when there would be an eight week requirement that you would have to have your abortion. I think that um, I would, um, I think that abortion is a very personal decision. It should be between um, the the pregnant person and their health care provider, and um, I think HB 302 was government overreach. Thank you. We'll start the answers to question number two with Barbara. West Virginia has a crisis in our foster care system. Too many children in foster care, too few qualified workers, salaries are too low. What solutions do you support to improve our foster care system? Thank you for that question. Um, foster care is an issue that I've been working on for many, many years, and it is a difficult issue. Um, and it's related to pay. Um, most of the people who are in Child Protective Service are women and they have a very responsible job. Um, I think that what I think about a lot is, you know, if I were a person that had seen a child with cigarette burns and then wasn't sure maybe if it was accidental or on purpose and then I had to go home and make food for my family and do the things around the home, that that would be extremely, extremely stressful. And that's why we have such an enormous turnover. Um, it's a huge turnover. It's been a turnover for a long time. We, we did pass a pay equity increase a very long time ago. And um, we've had some smaller pay increases. But I think, I think that's part of the problem. I think the opioid crisis is part of the problem. And I think that um, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing that one of the things that our government should be responsible for is the welfare of children. And so I think a much higher priority needs to be placed on foster care and on making sure that the system works. It doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Thank you. And may I call you Mike? Sure. <laughs> okay. What solutions do you support for improving our foster care system? For those of you that may have listened to me on talk radio in the past, uh, this is something that I've talked about. I think that the foster care issue is one of our biggest problems in West Virginia. Nearly 7,000 children are in need of someone to love them and care for them. And we as a state can do a much better job than what we're doing now in providing that support. We have too many barriers in place for people who would make fit parents, whether it be for a short period of time or an extended period of time. We have too many barriers for people to be able to demonstrate that and become available. We create too many barriers when somebody initially begins to provide foster care and we don't provide the necessary compensation for somebody to be able to deliver the care. I think that making foster care uh, changes and, and developing it in such a way 
that we can meet the needs of, this ch of these children will be something profoundly uh, impactful for our state because these children, if, if left without the support and care and love that they need now, um, they will have a lot of problems in the future. I, I talked to a good friend from Southern West Virginia and he indicated to me that there were multiple uh, children in his children's classroom um, that were in foster care settings or had no one at all caring for them and their family was helping provide support. So uh, you have for me a commitment to drill down into this issue, find solutions, work with our DHHR and other agencies and help these children along the way. Thank you. Question number three, we'll start with Mike. In 2020, despite the pandemic, West Virginia had historically high voter turnout. Turnout was enhanced by the availability of absentee ballots. Do you favor or oppose making absentee voting available to all registered voters who apply for a ballot? I have ri written pages of election law in West Virginia. I, I doubt that there are maybe any other members of the West Virginia legislature who have written more election law than I have. And I'm of the opinion that the absentee process serves a very valuable role in enabling people who are simply unable to vote during early voting or during election day. And that generally applies to people who are in poor health. It also applies to people out of state and oftentimes out of the country. And of course it applies to my colleagues serving in the military around the globe. And that for me is the purpose of absentee voting. Beyond that, with the days that we have available for early in-person voting and the 13 hours available on election day, I believe we provide a suitable opportunity for people to vote, particularly those people who wish to take the time and learn about the candidates and involve themselves in the campaign. So absentee voting for me, have it be early, give plenty of time for those ballots to be mailed out people to vote the ballots and mail them back. I want the ballots to be received before the day of the election. If people turn in ballots, I only want somebody to be able to bring in two and then move into the early voting in person period ending on Saturday before election day and then a 13 hour election day period of time when regardless of someone's work schedule, they likely would be able to vote. Thank you. And Barbara, the same question to you. Do you favor or oppose making absentee voting available to all registered voters who apply? I support that concept. I think that we had a great uh, election in West Virginia in terms of participation and in terms of the lack of any discernible fraud. And um, I, I I think it worked. It works in other states, and um, I think it was a successful experiment. I don't know why we wouldn't continue with it. And um, I also am in favor of voting by mail. Many states do that. We had a pilot project that I sponsored for voting by mail in, in the city and in municipal government. That was successful. That increased voter turnout substantially. And um, I, for example, Oregon has had it for like a decade or more. So I, th I think that voting is really, really important. And we, not, we should not be discouraging people from voting. We should try to make it easier because we want people to participate in our government. We don't want to do things to make that people think that voting is in any way bad. Voting is good. That is the foundation. That's why we separated from England because we wanted to vote and we wanted to decide our future. We wanted especially um, to make sure we had a say in taxes. So I think just the opposite of um, anything that, that would make it harder to vote. We should, we should be, it has to be accountable. We need to make, we need to check and make sure that, that people don't vote twice, obviously. But um, I think that there, we know how to do that in, the, in 2022 and we should just keep doing that. And um, I, I think it's a good idea. No excuse absentee voting. Thank you. 
Question number four starts with Barbara. Do you believe Joe Biden was legitimately elected president of the United States in 2020? Yes. He won by millions and millions of votes, and um, there wasn't proof of fraud that would have in any way, shape, or form uh, overturned the election. Thank you. And Mike, do you believe Joe Biden was legitimately elected president in 2020? I watched on television the United States Congress certify the election. So yes, he was certified. He is the president. And this election is about the failures of the last 24 months that he's been in office. The failures in which he's damaged our economic security, our energy security, our border security, and our national security. So this election is not about how the votes were cast or counted two years ago. This election is about the past 24 months of Joe Biden being our president, the 40-year high inflation that we're experiencing in West Virginia, the stress that that's putting on families in our state who are unable to simply buy gas and groceries. We're looking at the most expensive Thanksgiving Day dinner in the history of our country, and we are heading hard into winter where we will have the highest heating fuels in the history of our country because of the failures of the Biden administration. My opponent is flying under the flag of that president, and I am not. Thank you. Question number five starts with you, Mike. Should K-12, K through 12 education outside the public school system be held accountable for student educational outcomes? If so, how? Well, when you look at the spending of the legislature, 50% of the spending of the legislature's general revenue dollars, approximately $2.4 billion dollars, is spent on public education. So if there is not accountability over public education, you should fire 134 legislators. So yes, I believe there should be accountability. I believe there are plenty of models all across the country that can be used to create that accountability and recognize the achievement in our classroom. I would like to see a system where we reward teachers who achieve higher levels of success in their classrooms. I would like to see us promote opportunities where we have locality pay, where teachers who live in areas where it's very expensive to live, particularly during 40-year high inflation, where we're able to help with their costs through some form of locality pay. I believe we should incentivize teachers to go into difficult areas of the community and in, into the state that have uh, academic specialties, uh, particularly in the area of special needs. Uh, we need to do all we can to attract our best and brightest teachers into the areas where there are students who have special needs. We can provide early intervention and help them turn the corner early and not fall further and further behind. Uh, but of course we need accountability and that comes with legislators being engaged. It also comes from our 55 school boards, and we as a legislature should support those 55 school boards and all that they do, and we should support our state school board, enabling them to make quality decisions that improve the quality of public education in West Virginia. Thank you. And Barbara, the question goes to you. Should K through 12 education outside the public school system be held accountable for educational outcomes? So, actually, are you talking about charter schools I, and, and home schooling? Is that what the question is? Yes, and I, I should have stopped you, Mike, but I will rephrase the question and we'll do it again, if that's okay. Well, maybe Go. he should... Um, well, I don't know. Um, I think that right now we are having problems uh, post-pandemic. And I think it's really unfortunate that we have expanded um, options for families when everyone is trying to recover from the pandemic. 
I don't, I'm not opposed to charter schools. I'm not opposed to homeschooling, but I think right now what our kids desperately need is stability. I think, and, and they get that at public schools. And I think to, um, I, th I think it's a really big problem, the, the expand, the, the, the Hope Scholarship and the charter schools are going to be siphoning money away from our public schools. And we, uh, many of our most vulnerable children are not going to be going to private schools. They're not going to be going to for-profit private schools or non-profit private schools. And they are going to fall behind. And that's part of what public education does, is it's a level playing field where we can all do well. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the lack of accountability. Um, it is, it is the, the laws that we passed are um, co almost lacking in, in ways. And, and, and same with homeschool. Right now, you don't have to be a graduate of high school to be a homeschool teacher, and it's been that way for five years. And we have, I think we even loosened the portfolio requirements that students would have to submit. So I'm really worried that there are going to be irresponsible parents taking this money and not making sure that their children are educated and that we will not have the workforce of the future that we need to thrive in West Virginia, a well-educated workforce. Mike, I'll give you just a, a minute to uh, answer the question again. Yes. Delegate Fleshauer said that stability only comes in public schools. I couldn't I disagree more. That. She said you have to have public schools to have stability. We have very successful schools throughout the county, and we have hundreds of children being homeschooled who are in very safe and stable environments. I think parents should have a right to choose how they educate their children. I was appalled by Delegate Fleshauer's comments on WAJR and on Metro News when she said she was worried that mothers would receive the Hope Scholarship and they would spend that money on drugs. That is not the way I look at West Virginia mothers. I love my mother, I love my wife and the role she has played as a mother, and I know mothers would do what is in the best interest of their children. Thank you. Question six starts with Barbara. What is your position on permitting transgendered K through 12 students to participate in sports aligned with their gender identity? Thank you for that question. Um, I think that is a solution looking for a problem. I do not think we have a problem that needs to be addressed that uh, the bill that passed in the legislature um, dealt with. I voted against that. I think there are repercussions that maybe some people haven't thought of. I think that uh, young people are offended by the idea, young people understand that many children are different from other children. And um, my child is different from other children. And I love her. And I want all children to be appreciated in schools. And um, I think in not only are our children this bill was an affront to many children, and they are going to vote with their feet by leaving, I believe. It is also going to be a problem to recruit companies like Google and Facebook so that we can diversify our com economy, because their employees and their policies want inclusivity. So I think that it was an unwise move, and that's why I voted no. Thank you. And Mike? What is your position on permitting transgender students to participate in sports aligned with their gender identity? I think public school students who go through a process of transitioning need our love and support. Oftentimes they may need special counseling to help them through what must be a very difficult experience. I don't support boys who are transgendering competing against girls in sports. I didn't allow my son to roughhouse with my daughter, 
and I don't want somebody else's son roughhousing with my daughter either. We can create a level playing field, but it's not boys playing in girls' sports. And I think it's ironic on the 50th anniversary of Title IX that Delegate Fleshauer voted to allow boys to compete in girls' sports, potentially jeopardizing what was created over a period of 50 years, a period of equality, a period of opportunity, a period for scholarships, and to allow a change that could disrupt that delicate balance. And if you don't believe me, just go watch a pole vaulting match and see how far a girl can jump in the air and how far a boy can jump in the air. Go watch a swim meet and see how fast a boy can swim and how fast a girl can swim. There are hundreds of boys in America, in high school, who can run faster than the fastest woman in the world. And so to allow boys to compete in girls' sports doesn't seem like a problem today because we have very few in West Virginia, but it could become a problem in the future. And I want for the young girls of West Virginia the best facilities, the best opportunities, and I want a safe environment where they can compete and where they can win, where they can excel, and where they can receive scholarships to attend school at the next level. Thank you. Question number seven starts with you, Mike. What is your position on diversifying West Virginia's energy industry by allowing community solar facilities where a homeowner can purchase a share of a solar farm to produce their own electricity? Really, on any of the energy issues, I subscribe to the all of the above theory. I think that we should allow people to pursue opportunities, just like the Berkshire Hathaway opportunity that occurred earlier this year. Uh, individual citizens, uh, every, every form of energy, coal, oil, natural gas, hydro, uh, solar, wind. Um, we need an all of the above approach. Uh, I have uh, supported that in the past and would in the future. Uh, I want us to continue to support our traditional industries, coal and natural gas, to provide a baseline of support so that we don't find ourselves like California or Texas in those desperate situations trying to provide uh, electricity. So I'm um, generally an all of the above person as long as it makes sense, as long as it doesn't infringe on other people's property, uh, and as long as it can be done in a way that's fair and equitable. Thank you. And Barbara, what is your position on allowing community solar facilities where a homeowner can purchase a share of a solar farm to produce their own electricity? Thank you for the question. I think that's a great idea. Um, that is something that has been uh, passed in other states, and I think it's something that we need here. And I think that um, we need to do more and more to diversify our energy sources. And obviously the sun is one of the ways that we can do that. Um, I believe that global warming is real. Uh, I think the heat this summer was unbelievable, and I think the rain this summer was unbelievable, and obviously those people that live uh, near in, in hurricane areas and that w in the, the north uh, or, or the south in the Arctic areas that we are, you know, the, the polar ice is melting. And, and, you know, I wasn't so sure when I first heard about global warming whether the catastrophes that they were predicting were going to happen so quickly, but they are happening as we watch them. So I think it's really important to do everything we can to, um, to expand the different types of energy we have. And so I think the, the battery facility one of the things we have to do if we're going to be using solar is, figure, is, is figuring out ways to store that. And I think that battery facility is, is a really interesting concept. I think we need to be making more batteries here um, and so that we can be self-sufficient with energy in the future. And I agree that we also need our traditional industries um, uh, to continue while we diversify all of these different sources. We, we've got wind 
And um, I think community solar is a great idea. Thank, Thank you. you. And the next question is kind of redundant now that I think about it, but it starts with Barbara. What, would, what should West Virginia do to address climate change and the increased flooding it is bringing to the state? Well, you know, I was listening to the news tonight about some people that were um, angry with FEMA over assistance that they were getting after wildfires in California. And it just seemed like it was pretty misplaced anger. Um, that, you know, whenever you have a problem that's been predicted, I think the best thing to do is plan for it. And uh, we have uh, land use planning rules that you shouldn't be building on floodplains. I think we, um, the, our topography and the way that our homes have been built and our industries have been placed in the floodplains or, you know, uh, I think we're probably gonna have to change all of our floodplains because we are having floods frequently that are of historic proportion and are, you know, you just hear 100 year flood all the time. And so I think that we need to, our emergency preparedness really needs to be beefed up for things that have never happened before in the past. I think flooding is the most serious issue for us for climate change, but I think that um, we, we need to face up to that, and I don't think that is an issue that the legislature has really addressed yet, is what, what do we do with the, um, to help people um, deal with, recover from, uh, torrential rain and flooding. So I think that's an important issue that we, we need to work on more. Thank you. And Mike, uh, how do you think West Virginia should address climate change and the increased flooding it is bringing to West Virginia? Thank you. I would hope that other legislators would follow my lead. We had historic flooding in our community and I led an initiative to address the flooding of the Pompano Run and boroughs run. I coordinated an effort with city, county, state officials, both state division of highways and the state uh, DEP. I worked with the federal government to help secure a loan, discounted interest rate loan from the EPA, and worked with a number of homeowners throughout the boroughs run and Papano run area. We worked with the university as they began construction of a new alumni center, and together, we put together a $9 million project addressing the flooding concerns through Burroughs Run and Pompano Run. I left office, and for the next 12 years, the legislators in this area, the county commissioners, the city council, were unable to act on any changes. More blacktop was laid, more roofs were built, more water was consolidating, and we saw last summer the failure of continuing to act after significant repairs had been made. So what we need is we need active legislators, county commissioners, city <coughs> officials, identifying the areas most subject to flooding and then pursuing opportunities to address that flooding. One of the ways I pursued it was creating a stormwater utility where entities that create stormwater runoff could pay a fee and that fee then could be used to purchase bonds to pay for construction. So I've done it, I've done it successfully, and others came behind me and failed to make any changes or improvements as more blacktop and more rooftops came into play. Thank you. Question nine starts with you, Mike. Some people suggest that good roads, a clean environment, and a skilled workforce may be more attractive than tax cuts to bringing new businesses to West Virginia. What do you think? I think tax cuts can help bring some of those things, certainly. I'll double check your list here again. <laughs> uh, certainly, tax cuts that would bring business into the state and help existing business grow could create the dollars 
to provide some of the things you're talking about. But clearly, we are in a position in West Virginia where we have unparalleled surpluses, more surplus than at any point in the history of the state. And over the past 100 days, we have a half, a half of a billion dollars in, in new surplus. So we ought to be in a place where we can provide some of the improvements that you mentioned and enhance the quality of life uh, for our citizens and do that in such a way that people will want to stay here and others who come to visit will want to move here. Thank you. And Barbara? Some people suggest that good roads, a clean environment, and a skilled workforce may be more attractive than tax cuts to bringing new business to West Virginia. What do you think? Um, I think that is probably true. Um, we have cut taxes over and over and over again. And we have um, the Tax Foundation rates us as uh, one of the best tax climates in among all, or the best among all our surrounding states. Good roads, a skilled workforce, and a clean environment are going to require investments. And do we want to say that um, we, we are going to limit our ability to make those investments because we want to give business tax cuts or other tax cuts? I think um, I disagree about the surplus. I think it's an artificial surplus. I think the revenue estimates are um, don't square with reality. It's based on a temporary influx of funding because of the pandemic, and we would be using that funding, funding not for dealing with the problems of pandemics, but to give out a big, uh, what's being proposed is giving out a tax cut, 70% of which would go to businesses. I think the governor's idea about giving a personal income tax break on vehicles to um, is, is an okay idea, make it into rebate. I think that's much more fiscally responsible because I think a permanent change like the, um, the amendment two would permit and which people have, uh, legislators have said they want to give is dangerous fiscal policy. And so I believe that what we need in West Virginia, and since 1932, when we passed a road bond amendment, we need good roads in this state, and we don't have them. And, and that's going to take money. And we need a skilled workforce, and we need a clean environment, and those things cost money, for which a giant business tax break would make, um, would make impossible. Thank you. And question 10 starts with Barbara. Some analysts suggest that last year's, that last fiscal year's 1.3 billion surplus was caused by lowballed revenue estimates, massive infusions of pandemic related federal dollars, and failure to adequately fund existing state needs. Please explain your approach to managing a state budget surplus that may or may not be durable. Well, I think I kind of answered that in my last question, but um, I am a fiscal conservative. I think that just like in your home, you don't spend money unless you're really sure we have it. And I agree with all of those things. I think the, the, we had low-balled um, revenue estimates and um, a failure, actually, I can't remember. I didn't write that down carefully enough. But I think that what we need to do with that surplus is be careful. And um, I th there, there may be enough money for a vehicle tax uh, rebate. I hope there is. Um, but I, I think that we don't know what's going to happen with the stock market. Most of us who have our money, our pension money in the stock market have seen large portions of it disappear. And this money that is in the surplus is also invested in the, in the uh, stock market and it could dramatically d go down. So I don't think we should spend it um, under these circumstances. Um, and, and I just have to say that um, 
I think it's kind of ironic that our, my colleague was saying that, um, that, that this is all about Biden. I don't think it's about Biden. I think it's about this race is a state race. It is not a federal race. And, um, and we should be talking about the state issues, which have very much to do with the pandemic. Sorry about that phone. It's new and it won't turn off. Um, so Mike, the question goes to you now. Please explain your approach to managing a state budget surplus that may or may not be durable. Well, if it walks like a duck and it squacks like a duck, it talks like it, it's a duck, right? I mean, I mean, we have a $1.3 billion surplus, and we brought in about $500 million more than what was to be spent the last 100 days. For somebody to say this is not the time to return dollars to the taxpayer, when would that time ever come? When would that time ever come if at this point almost $2 billion ahead of revenues over the past 15 months? I think we need to return dollars to our, to our constituents. We need to help them during this 40-year high inflationary time. We need to help them with these rising gasoline costs. We need to help them with the rising grocery costs. Winter is coming, and this may well be the most expensive winter West Virginians have ever had based on the cost of energy to, to fuel, to heat our homes and help us throughout this winter. So um, the surplus is there. We have to find some ways, I think, to get it back into the pockets of the people who put it there. And I would look for ways to do that if given an opportunity to serve in the legislature. Thank you. I neglected at the beginning to say if the audience has questions they would like to submit for us to deal with at the end, we're passing out cards. You can write your questions down and pass them to the end, and we'll ask them at, at, after we're finished. Question 11 goes to you, Mike, first. Amendment 1 would change the West Virginia Constitution to state that courts and judges may play no part in the impeachment process in the state legislature. Do you support or oppose Amendment 1? And please explain. We have three branches of government. The role of the legislature is to decide if they wish to impeach a state official. It is the role of the House of Delegates to do the impeachment. And it is the role of the state Senate to conduct a trial. And it's my opinion that the legislature ought to be able to do that without interference from either of the other two branches. Thank you. Bar Barbara, do you support or oppose Amendment 1? Please explain. Thank you. I oppose Amendment 1 and I voted against it. I think that, I agree that we have, I could agree insofar as that we have three branches of government. But I really don't think the legislature, um, uh, sh and, and I was involved, I was the minority judiciary chair during the impeachment process. And what the legislature did, I thought was very wrong. We, the legislature brought charges against the third branch of government, all five members. There were some uh, who I think committed some serious wrongs, but others, I don't, I, I thought it was outrageous to, to go after the entire third branch of government. And, and I think that is an example of what uh, we shouldn't have happen. There, if, if you have, or for example, what if there's fraud? What if there were made up charges and people were um, challenged and there was no, re no recourse whatsoever to the legislature's process of impeaching uh, officials, and this would apply um, up and down. So I think that um, it's once again, it's a power grab by the legislature. And I think that uh, it is important to preserve the separation and the, integr the integrity of both branches, and so I'll, I'll be voting no. 
Thank you. All three branches. Thank you. Uh, the next question starts with you, Barbara. Amendment 2 would change the West Virginia Constitution to give the legislature the power to control taxes on machinery, equipment, inventory for businesses, and on personal property for individuals. Amendment 2 would not automatically lower taxes, and a plan to replace lost revenue has not been agreed upon. Do you support or oppose Amendment 2? I oppose Amendment 2. I voted against it in the legislature. I think it is a power grab once again. Um, the current leadership of the legislature has indicated they have every intention of uh, enacting legislation uh, following passage of the amendment that would give a very large um, tax break to uh, businesses, 70% of this would go to businesses, and it would have potential, very, very dangerous effects on uh, municipal government, on school government, um, and, uh, and on county governments. Um, passage of Amendment 2 would give control of 27% of property taxes to the state legislature. Um, w when that has been in the hands of school boards and county commissions and municipalities. And it would end uh, protection for the services that we receive. I'm especially worried about how it could affect K through 12 education. And um, because such a big part of that uh, two-thirds of property tax revenues fund K through 12. I've said earlier that I'm worried about public schools um, after the pandemic, and I would be even more worried for public schools if Amendment 2 passes. Thank you. And now to Mike. Do you support or oppose Amendment 2? Please explain. Thank you. This one's a tricky one because supporting or opposing the amendment and all of the things that people describe that would automatically be done if the amendment was passed are two very different things. By you as a citizen voting for amendment two, you are giving the legislature flexibility with respect to six areas of property taxes. By voting no, you're allowing the legislature to not have that flexibility. These taxes were put into place during the Great Depression when West Virginia was in a very difficult place financially. And the voters cast their vote to put these taxes in place. Today, West Virginia's legislature is handcuffed by a 90-year-old vote of the people. And what I would suggest we consider doing and it's up to each of you individually. I am just one vote. I'm not an author of this amendment. Uh, I'm one vote. But I would suggest that you consider undoing those handcuffs and giving the legislature the full flexibility of tax policy and spending policy. When we look at our neighboring states, we see that those states don't tax business equipment, business machinery, business inventories. And that puts West Virginia in a competitive disadvantage. So I would say to you as voters, it's your decision. If you want the legislature to have more flexibility, you should vote for Amendment 2. If you don't want the legislature to have that additional flexibility, you should vote no. But you should also know that the Senate plan, which is not guaranteed, the Senate plan calls for Montague County to receive a 25% increase in tax revenues should the amendment pass and should the exemptions change. Thank you. The next question starts with you, Mike. Amendment four would change the West Virginia Constitution to give the legislature the authority to overrule or change any rules or policies adopted by the West Virginia State Board of Education. The Board of Ed, an appointed bipartisan body with members approved by the legislature, opposes this amendment. Do you support or oppose Amendment 4? 
I've not taken a public position on this amendment. I would let the voters decide as they choose. I have told my colleagues in the legislature having additional accountability might make sense in terms of being able to approve rules and regulations. And I have also told my colleagues in the legislature, be careful what you ask for, because this could become uh, a task of the legislature that could be very all-consuming uh, should they enter into this. But understand that half of the dollars that the legislature appropriates, those general revenue dollars, half of them go into all the state agencies that run state government. And the other half of those dollars go to public education. In that half that goes to everything else, it is the legislature who approves the rules and regulations for those agencies. And that half that goes to public education, the legislature does not have any control over the rules and regulations. Those who argue against this tell you that by doing this, it would politicize public education. I would suggest to you, if you have ever been to a public school board meeting, you would see that politics is alive and well there already. But I've not taken a public position. I would allow the voters to decide, understanding if you want your legislature to be more involved, if you want to reach out to your legislature, individual members, and say, I object to this policy and I want you to do something about it, you should vote for this amendment. If you want your legislature to be hands off on public schools, then you should vote against this. Thank you. And now to you, Barbara, do you support or oppose Amendment 4? Thank you for that question. I'm opposed to Amendment 4 and I, uh, Amendment 4, four. is that, uh, I voted against it um, in the, the legislature. I think, once again, it is another power grab by the legislature. Um, and I do fear that um, it would politicize public education. I, I agree with Mike. I think there's a risk that it could be all consuming for the legislature. Um, th if, if every single decision about education is gonna be brought up during the 60 day session. I think that the system that we have with the school board and having the Department of Education um, be uh, serving the State Board of Education uh, members is working uh, relatively well, and that uh, I, don't, I don't think we want to go to a system that is worse. So I think that um, it is not a needed amendment. And I, I think it, we passed this amendment not that long ago, and I uh, think it was voted on the people. I don't think we need to reverse it. Thank you. Those are, our, <clears throat> those are our prepared questions. We have a couple of questions from the audience. We haven't addressed uh, Amendment oh, 3 I'm sorry. yet. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't addressed Amendment 3 yet. We didn't address Amendment 3. It's on the ballot. We, we don't have a position on Amendment 3. If you someone from the audience would like to ask a question about Amendment 3, we can do that. Well, we have four amendments on the ballot. You asked us about three of the four. I just... Well, I think it's up to them to ask the question, Mike. Isn't it? I just didn't understand why. I thought maybe it just was an oversight. Mm -mm. No, we didn't okay. intend to ask a question about that. Well, I support Amendment 3. Here's a question from the, from the uh, audience. Watching the Mon County School Board last month, it was stated we hired 50 additional staff members with federal dollars. We face an $8 million shortage in 2024. In Mon County, Senator Clemens stated we are bailing out counties with lost tax revenue. Wouldn't that $1.3 billion be a handy fund for school for such things? Let's see, who started the last question? I think, Mike, you started the last question, so that'll go to Barbara. Thank you. Um, we're just one out of 55 counties, and um, eight million is a large amount of money to, to be at, behind. And we really needed those 50 additional staff members during the pandemic, and I think we still need them. 
And um, I do think that, that I am very worried about public education and I think we need an infusion to help our children get through this rough time. So I would say the answer to that question is yes. Do you want me to repeat the question? That's okay. Uh, I, I, w I, wasn't, I wasn't privy to that discussion earlier, but clearly we need to properly fund our public schools. I know that um, during this 30-month period of COVID, there has been substantial dollars that have been pushed toward public education. And as, as your state senator, I would advocate and fight for those dollars to improve the quality of our public schools. I am the product of public schools. I attended first grade to senior year here in Montague County in all public schools. I'm a product of a public higher education that was paid for by the Pell Grant. Uh, I understand the importance of public education and how it is the great equalizer that allows people to succeed. And I will be a champion of, of public education. Thank you. And now we're ready for closing statements. And Barbara, you get to start. So a closing statement, please. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to be the first female elected to the state Senate from either Monongalia or Marion County. I think that would be um, a wonderful uh, thing to have happen. And I think I'm well qualified for that position. Um, I don't think my colleague should be elected. Um, I, 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 and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, I think his position on women's rights and an, on our ability to make moral decisions on abortion is um, insulting and that we should the government should not force us to make health care decisions or force us to see pictures of fetuses or force um, girls who maybe were raped by their parents um, to get permission of their parents to decide that they do not, that they are not ready or for whatever reason they are not wanting to have a child. I also think that his decision to be state chair of ALEC was misguided. That um, organization is a national group that urges, that is funded by big corporations, including the Koch brothers, that urges us to uh, eliminate and limit regulation, especially of pollution. So, I mean, one thing we don't need in West Virginia is um, loosening of our uh, water protection. Or, and we, we've had some really serious environmental disasters in our state. And um, for example, the spill in Charleston. So I, I think that I am the most qualified for this position and I urge you to vote for me either early, by voting early, or on November 8th. Thank you. And Mr. Oliverio, your closing statement, please. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Fleshauer's disingenuous comment about parental consent. Clearly she knows that I supported a judicial bypass when West Virginia children were raped or incest was involved where they could go to a court and obtain the permission for an abortion. She knows that. It's an effort on her part to misrepresent my record just as she has done with fundraising letters and other techniques. I want to thank the League for hosting tonight, and I want to thank everybody that's come out. I want to thank those who are watching online. I was the Alex State Chair, and I followed Joe Manchin in that role. He was the State Chair before me, Democratic State Senator. He was actually the National Vice President of Alec uh, while I was a member. Uh, so she can demonize that organization. She won't tell you that I was also a member of the National Conference of State Legislators. She won't tell you I was a member of the Southern Legislative Conference. She won't tell you about my work on the American Council in which I went to Ukraine and Russia where I taught classes on democracy and toured schools and churches and libraries, had meetings in the Kremlin and learned all about Kiev. And the experiences I had there, I brought back to West Virginia 
and I helped many legislators follow in my footsteps with ACYPL. She won't share those things with you. She wants to pick one organization that I was involved with and attempt to demonize me over my involvement with that. I've been proud to serve this community in the West Virginia State Senate in the past. If I'm given an opportunity to go back, I want to improve our roads and bridges, expand our broadband, diversify our economy, and fight for our fair share of funding from Charleston that we are currently not receiving under the leadership we have today. Thank you for your time and attention to tonight's forum. Thank you very much. And we really appreciate both of you for, for attending tonight and presenting your views and helping the League and our partners educate the public before they make an important voting decision. So thank you very much.